afternoon. I'm Charles Solomon. I'll be your moderator here at Animation is Film. Uh, I was fortunate to write the book about the making of Prince of Egypt way back when. Uh, you may have a hard time believing that it's been 20 years when you see all these fresh-faced kids uh, who made the movie. Um, to begin, why don't we begin with the directors? We have Brenda Chapman. Simon Wells, and Steve Hickman. Producing Sandra Ravens, and Kenny Chickenman Fox. And animator Christoph Saran. Uh, Talk, uh, question for uh, any and all of you. I'm wondering, 20 years ago, this was a chance to see a studio built from the ground up under this first film, something that hadn't happened in animation in America in a long time. And I'm wondering your memories of that excitement and hearing for the first time that, oh, there's going to be something besides Disney now. There's going to be something really high end, something that involves very talented people. Do you want to come be a part of it? You can't do this, you should start. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was exciting. And it just seemed that uh, Disney was getting very um, corporate and uh, a little bit big for its britches at the time. <laughs> and I think a few of us were looking forward to starting something fresh and, and trying something new. So a few of us jumped ship. A lot of us stayed, I think, but a few of us jumped ship to give it a try, and it was exciting. It was a new time. Um, there's a whole crowd of us came over from Europe, actually. Christoph uh, William is over there in the audience, a bunch of other people. Um, and Steve and I had been running a studio in London called Animation uh, for Spielberg. And so it was very natural that when Katzenberg and Spielberg and Geffen got together, um, Spielberg sort of arranged for 120 of us to come over and, uh, and kind of be part of forming um, DreamWorks Animation. So in a sense, there were, there were quite a lot of us who had actually been working together for really, what, five years before then, um, which is part of how the thing could be as sort of artistically cohesive as it was. I wanted to say that the original five, I think, are in the room today. Richie Chavez, where are you? Richie. Lorna Cook. Where are you? Brenda, who walked in the room and the next day went into back surgery. <laughs> um, and Penny and I. But. Oh, and Kathy Altieri, which who is not here, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but Sandy, you, you bring up an interesting point. 20 years ago, if you were bringing together the principal actors, creators of an animated film, would you have had three, three women anywhere else? Probably not. Jeffrey was very inclusive of women. And uh, having been employee number one <laughs> for this <laughs> studio, I was pretty surprised. But we had women in all areas. So a lot of what's going on today and the discussions of the Me Too movement and inclusivity. I just want to point out, this is a movie where every character is not a Caucasian. <laughs> no, and, uh, and Brenda, you became the first woman to direct an animated feature Woo! since Lottie Reidiger in 1926. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, that that was that was another Jeffrey thing where I just wanted to come and have the creative freedom to start a new story department. You know, and that was my goal when I came to DreamWorks to, was to 
be ahead of story. And and Jeffrey <laughs> Jeffrey kept saying, Brenda, you're gonna direct this. And I was like, No, Jeffrey, I'm not. Brenda, you're gonna direct this. No, Jeffrey, I'm not. <laughs> I think he won. So <laughs> Um, I'm uh, just hearing this dialogue. I'm curious, how did the three of you divide your duties uh, as co-directors? You know, we've had, it's not unusual for an animated film to have two, but three was, was something, something new, and I'm wondering how you divided <laughs> up the truth. <laughs> or are you still quarreling over that? Well, luckily we all seem to be on the same page. If we weren't, I think it could have been a disaster. But... I don't remember any like massive disagreements as he says lying through his teeth. <laughs> but no, really, we, we got along really well and have remained friends for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, on a technical level, um, we, we decided early on we all wanted to be together in story because the whole thing comes out of story. If story doesn't work, the movie doesn't work. So we said we're not breaking that up. We want to be together. And then also for the animation performance stuff, all the stuff where we're looking over how uh, the, the actual performance is coming across. That was something we also said we want to be the three of us together, which caused a real pain for people trying to organize our, our schedules. But then there were that I remember. All, all the other sort of parts that were broken up. Um, Christoph, it said that no man can serve two masters. You had three. How did, how did that go? Uh, three masters. Yeah, they were three friends. I mean, two of them were already new, so, and, and you know, it was, it was great. It was a great experience. Uh, and I was lucky that I uh, shared Moses with William because William Salazar did the younger Moses and I did the older uh, version. And so when I took over the character, uh, there was only the, I mean, already younger Moses was designed, so it was just a matter of adding a few wrinkles here and there. <laughs> Grow the hair and stuff, and I had the, I had the model. Um, Sandy and Penny, as the producers of a studio's first film, was there a particular pressure that we have to start this right, this has to be on budget, this has to be on schedule, because there, there wasn't a, a backlog or a slack that you could, you could play against? Um, I'll never experience this again. The answer to your question is no. Jeffrey wanted it right. He wanted it good. And even though we kept our eyes on the schedule and the budget, he was most concerned with getting a very challenging, difficult story to have all the elements you need, including fun and entertainment and drama and music, and then making it a musical on top of it and getting it all to work together. I don't think I've ever had a harder challenge. Sandy, do you want to add to that? I just want to say that I started a lot of animation studios and we had so much fun. Um, I remember Jeffrey saying to me like after the first year, I didn't think it was gonna go this easy and this well. And it's a tribute to the talent. We had the most amazing artists, management people, and when I looked up at the screen at the credits, the people on that screen are the animation industry today. They are the senior talent. They were amazing people. They all came together because they wanted to show that they could be as good as Disney. And I think this movie showed that. Um, I something we all believed, which is make everybody step up and go beyond where they came from, which meant that everybody was a part of making a movie and growing themselves at the same time, which is a rare opportunity. Um, something you alluded to, Penny, is that you were dealing with a story that was sacred to three faiths, not always noted for tolerance or allowing much uh, wiggle room on that story. And I'm wondering for all of you, how, what kind of challenge did that present, and what were your thoughts about what, how did you react to that when you realized that we are going to be dealing with something that is so sacred to so many people, yet we still have to make a movie? So. Well, yeah, I knew you knew, Charles. I went all around the world with Jeffrey talking to religious leaders. It still was a challenge. Yeah. Now, I was just going to say, I think when Simon and Steve and I were scratching our heads trying to figure it out and we had a 
story artist, um, Ronnie Del Carmen. I'm sure many of you recognize that name. He did this incredible uh, sketch of Ramses sitting in the lap of the statue of Seti and his father, and Moses was at the bottom, and it, that sort of epitomized the idea of the father and son and then the brother story. And then we realized we were going to tell it from a more human point of view as opposed to a theological point of view. And and to, to reach the human audience. I mean, am I saying this right? Are we getting that right? <laughs> am I remembering that correctly? No, that was I, my, I, my memory of it. It's I, just I remember, I remember seeing story. that drawing. Um, I, again, I was asked to, to write the book and Jeffrey said, you can go anywhere, you can listen to anyone, you can watch whatever you want. You know, come and go, people will talk to you, we'll set up interviews, but poke around all you want. And I did, you took me with you to story meetings, to, to recording sessions. Um, I could go in and bother the animators while they were drawing and nobody ever wrapped my knuckles. <laughs> I haven't had that experience again either. <laughs> um, looking back, um, Penny and Sandy were saying how much talent they were able to bring together for this. Looking back, are there moments that each of you take particular pride in or remember, you know, this was a lot of work, but we got it to work? Christoph? You, went, you, were, at, you were there with oh, your yeah, pencil? I mean, so I, when I went to, I came to Los Angeles, I was, I, I remembered, I was, this is a movie I can't miss. This is the opportunity to come to the centers, and my uh, ambition was to go back to Europe after Prince of Egypt, and I've been here for 23 years now. Uh, and, and, and so that's funny, because I hadn't seen the movie for 20 years. This is the first time I ever saw the movie since then. And I remember, I mean, now I saw there's one of my characters says on the screen, this place, so many memories, and this is exactly how I feel when I see this thing. <laughs> I will remember when we were in Egypt and Steve and I were on the bus with Stephen Schwartz and he kept saying, I don't know what to write, I don't know, what am I going to do? And we said, just write um, when you wish upon a star, only make it relevant to Prince of Egypt. <laughs> and, that's, and that's where we got, uh, when you believe. Keep going please, Sandy. Well, I'll talk about actually one of the biggest disappointments that we tried to do on, in the movie, which is who, what is the voice of God? And the religious leaders had a very um, particular take on what it was, but we really wanted it to be the voices of our entire cast, because we believe the voice of God is in all of us and belongs to all of us. And when some of the religious leaders heard the female part of that voice and the struggle we had to try to make it one voice, uh, it was turned down. And we, uh, in the end, it's Val Kilmer's voice because it is the voice within himself. But that God's referred to as a he will probably be the biggest disappointment of the movie. I, re I remember we thought that was uh, around the time the movie Farinelli came out where they had somehow blended the two singing voices for that. And I remember talking to you about that and wondering if, if there was a way to do that, to blend all the voices together, which I hadn't thought of in 20 years. Steve, did you have a... It, it was funny about that The thing is that we later looked at other st tellings of the same story and we saw that Charlton Heston does the voice of God and in the Burt Lancaster one, he also did the voice of God. So we all came to the same conclusion independently, three different people. I think for, for me, uh, one of my highlights was that day that we got to, in Toronto, where we did Steve Martin and Martin Short. And we didn't know it at the time when we cast them, but they're like best friends. And once a year, they go off to Canada and go fishing in a cabin together and spend the week together. So we got them, not that video, so we, we got them, Right after they had been together for a week, they had incredible camaraderie. And Steve Martin, of course, was a magician at um, Disneyland for many years. And so we had bought some magic 
uh, tricks to put around from to play. And remember, he did an impromptu magic show for us. It was great. <laughs> That's a difficult story to follow. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a real downer, actually, because but I, I think the thing I, I'm kind of most proud of in the film is that there are emotional moments in the film, and I think probably the most extreme is, is Moses leaving uh, after, after Ramses has laid out his dead son. And Moses leaves and, and breaks down and cries. And we had long discussions. I can remember arguing with Jeffrey about this and literally acting it out um, with him. And, and to get to a place in, a, in an animated movie where you buy the emotional depth, the, the, the anguish in a character, for that character to be on screen for about 30 seconds just crying, um, that, that was kind of like, that was an amazing thing. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Sorry. You mentioned uh, a moment ago that you did go to Egypt and do research there. And I'm wondering if you have other souvenirs of that trip and how did seeing uh, these monuments and their scale and the intricacy of the hieroglyphics and so forth uh, affected your vision for the, of the film and, and what it could and should be? Well, there's a thing that, that uh, Derek was, uh, Derek Gogol, uh, amazing production designer, he, yeah, fantastic guy. Um, he was doing these huge temples and huge monuments, and we were kind of going, yeah, that's a little bit big, they weren't really that big, they were only sort of two or three stories high. And, um, and actually traveling around Egypt, you realize these things are stupendous coming out of, you know, a completely flat environment. And, and you think about what it must have been like to be, you know, a Bronze Age, early Iron Age guy, walk up to these things. And yeah, they kind of look like skyscrapers to you then and, and to us standing on the ground. So we, yeah, at that point we bought into Derek's vision. Yeah, that was also, he used to have to draw them on the outsized paper. His drawings were so big. That it went one eight and a half by eleven wouldn't begin to contain one. One one time we had this review for Jeffrey, and he looked at remember all the stuff around the room, and he goes, "Oh, it doesn't feel big enough." So the next week, Derek took his drawings and blew them up on the Xerox machine, so they were huge. So they covered the wall like a billboard. And Jeffrey came and said, "Now that's what I'm talking about." <laughs> But at the same time, we had this incredible contrast with uh, these giant drawings of Derek's, and then Richie would do these beautiful organic pieces for um, the Hebrews and what was out in the desert and Goshen. And it was just um, this wonderful contrast of the two worlds that lived together in, in one film. So. Just giving Richie over there his due there. <laughs> and Kathy's color, yeah. As far as the character goes, we had Carter Goodrich and Carlos Granjil, and they did an amazing John Nico, and, and all these designer, and uh, there was another one, uh, Peter. Peter. Yeah, Peter just said it's, I mean, we worked from all the, you know, when we designed the characters and we turned them into unimitable uh, humans, it was great to have all these but designs. Spe speaking of the designs, I know that um, you very deliberately changed the facial proportions of the characters, both to give them a graphic identity apart from Disney and all its clones, and to be more reflective of the Egyptian traditions of drawing faces and figures. Or is that a challenge to work with after having grown, you know, sort of spent most of your dealing with a single standard and suddenly here's a very different graphic style you're working in? Yes, this is a question for William Salazar. He should come on stage and explain because he's the guy who's responsible for William that. William here? Get up here. Hey, come over here. Okay. William Salazar. He has all the secrets. You, you did that, that model sheet with uh, the three, you know, divided. Okay, so explain, explain that to us. I thought I could escape. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I think when we, um, when we looked at the, uh, the design from Carter Goodrich, uh, uh, it was a big inspiration. Um, one of the main things was to... Uh, <clears throat> to make the, the designs different from the Disney characters. 
And one way we found was to uh, <coughs> elongate the faces of the uh, uh, of Moses, and it would contrast well with the face of uh, of Ramses, who is more uh, roundish, more square. Or so, yeah, Disney traditionally was eyes mad, are marked thirds in the in the head, yeah, yeah. and you yeah. pushed it more to like 30, uh, 40, 30, I think. Yes, it's difficult to explain, but it's just elongating the part between the eyes and the nose to make it longer and have a shorter uh, top fro forehead and, and bottom part of the mouth, and that would give a fairly uh, original uh, design that... Uh, we haven't seen before. And, uh, yeah, although the, the, the difference is actually fairly small. You've just seen those characters and they don't look like characters uh, from the fil from films before them. It's, it's a small difference, but it's a very striking one, particularly on when you see it on the, uh, the big screen. Yeah, and one of the challenges was, I remember, to, to do realistic animation or um, like naturalistic human and I know Jeffrey was not in favor of us shooting live action. We did it. <laughs> we did it on the side. Next time you're trying, you're uh, talking about the scene of Moses crying against the wall. I remember the animator Bruce Ferris because uh, I had no time to do this scene. I, I know you guys wanted me to do this scene, but I, I so I was like, oh, Bruce is going to do a good job. He did a great job. He did an amazing job. I was like. Okay, you might want to shoot some reference in live action. He said, "No, no, I'm going to try to do it on my own." And then he did some sketches, and then we shot live action from his sketches, and it was pretty good actually. So it was like a back and forth. But one of the challenges was to do a believable animation in no realism. Um, can you talk a little bit about casting the voices? As this was certainly um, a film with an all-star cast. I don't know of a, a live action film from around that time that had that many A-list talents in it. Um, can you talk a little bit about casting it and how you worked with the actors and the sort of what sort of inspiration did they um, bring to the animators? Um, we always knew that once we got the real actors in, some of the things that we had written for them, and it was a very delicate writing task, I think, and, and we did a lot of work to make sure the actors could say things that they could believe. Um, it made everything come alive because they were so talented. I mean, you know, that um, everyone from Val Kilmer to uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, but I'm, I'm really thinking of Sandra Bullock. Right, so Mitchell sat, sang the song from um, Midian, but no, I'm thinking forgetting Ray, Ray Fiennes. Fiennes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ray Fiennes just made that role come alive because he could do the complete range from irreverence to anger to genuine pain and hurtfulness. So and there's a bizarre vulnerability in his voice as well. Even when he's really angry, you can, you can kind of sense a scared child inside. Yeah, he was fantastic. Yeah, but I, re I remember oh. when, now that you... <laughs> Uh, now that you mentioned it, Benny, I remember the recording session with Ryan Stokes Mitchell because he had kicked off his shoes and was dancing around the recording booth uh, while he was singing. Yeah, and by the way, that, that, that was one of the few times we had live action references. We went and actually filmed uh, an Israeli dance troupe so we could get some of the movements. And I remember I was quite jealous to do because yeah. the Vicomer, I mean, in, in, when I saw the lipstick hand, there were bigger reference. Val Kilmer was amazing. He was acting in front of the microphone. He was doing all his gesture and everything. And Val Kilmer, I was doing the, the Moses from Val Kilmer voice. Val Kilmer was sitting on the, on the table. <laughs> Still, his, vo his vocal performance is amazing. I mean, I have to say, when Val Kilmer says, I love you, I kind of be, I believe it. Yeah, no, I mean, the vocal performance was great. This is just that I was hoping to get reference. It was just the voice, which was yeah, great. Yeah, he just performed like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, interrupted, <laughs> I interrupted you there, Sandy. Please, please pick up. Well, I want to say one of the best performances, I don't know if anybody knows, was that Sandy Bullock couldn't sing. So somebody else here sang for her. <laughs> Um, Brenda did it in Scratch. It was Brenda. She did it in Scratch when we were just kind of like roughing it out and then we couldn't get anybody else who did it as well and so we 
we took a, uh, I think a group decision. There was only one person who um, objected, and she got overwhelmed. <laughs> so yes, she is the singing voice when Miriam is singing at the well when she first meets Moses as an adult. Um, that is Brenda. It's rather good. <laughs> And your memories of that, Brenda? <laughs> I just, I left the room when they made the group decision. <laughs> um, I remember, though, at the time, it was still fairly unusual. I think something that Jeffrey really introduced was the, the a, very A-level actors uh, as voices. And I remember... Um, talking with all of you about what does an actor of that caliber bring to a role that, um, say, the radio actors of a previous generation uh, might not have brought. And I, I wondered if, if uh, you remember thoughts about that. I just remember that there was a depth that, that because this wasn't a comedy, um, there was a dramatic depth that they were able to bring that I think, you know, the, you know, those kind of actors <laughs> might, might not have brought. <laughs> um, but, but I also remember as a first time director being absolutely terrified, I felt like Jeffrey had tapped me on the shoulder as I was drawing, you know, um, and said, go direct Laurence Olivier when he told me that Ray Fiennes was going to be in there. I was like, oh, okay. Actually, I, have to share, I have to share a story because um, Patrick Stewart, who does SETI, um, is, yeah, I'm a huge fan of his work. And we had a recording session and generally you record actors on their own. Very occasionally we could get them together. But uh, we had Patrick Stewart in, and uh, I thought, I'm never going to get this opportunity again. So I went in and read against Patrick. I left these guys to, to uh, direct, because I wanted to actually experience, you know, being, uh, reading against him. And man, when you're in his sights, when he's like, you know, aiming the, those lines at you, it's chilling. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I, I remember interviewing him for the book, and... He uses that voice the way Dudamel uses the L.A. Philharmonic. You know, there is nothing accidental, nothing uncalculated. Mm -hmm. Everything is there producing the effect he wants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jeffrey would always say that great actors, actors are not just great because of the way they look or they're being known. They're great because they really have the talent. And we wanted everybody's best talent, the best acting we could find. Um, Sandy, I remember during the recording sessions, you told me that something you did that was more common in live action was to keep the mics running after someone seemed to have finished a take, that in that time that followed, there was something you would get that you might, that other animated uh, films might not have gotten, that you, you kept the mic, you kept the tapes running uh, longer than you would have, and that it, you just got more from the actor that way. I think the directors should come on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, you told me about it, but I didn't know the directors. To it, it was the caliber of actors that we had. You didn't want to cut them off. And, um, I hadn't done animation before, not not as a producer for sure, and had worked with a couple of the actors previously that we had in our cast, and they were tremendously talented. And if they wanted to do another take, our directors were very generous and allowed them to keep going because many of these actors would say, "I can do better," or "I can do an if another version of this." Do, do you remember? <laughs> you remember the one recording session with Jeff Goldblum? Uh, it, it, I mean, it was embarrassing. We had him in. You know, you, you book a four-hour session, and and we got Jeff in, and there were like three lines or something, and there was one word, and he did us like 10, 15 versions, and we said, "That's great," and he said, "Do you want any more?" And we said, "Sure," and he kept going. How, how many? I think he had 105 takes. <laughs> Eventually, we were saying, "Jeff, shut up, please stop." <laughs> Go home now. No more takes. Oh, we yeah, got another one. No, and I remember um, I came to one of the recording sessions with Sandra Bullock, and 
she would break the line down into pieces and just say, no, the second part of that could be better. I want to do that again. And you know, so you would set it up for her. But that every phrase was so thought about and uh, considered. I, I remembered something. <laughs> <laughs> now, the one, one of the few times we got the actors together was once with um, Jeff Goldblum and Sandra Bullock in the room when they were doing the bit at the well. And we had boarded that and talked about it being this really heavy, serious moment. And then the two of them got a hold of it, and they, they were hysterical. I mean, they they they, gave, they brought a humor to it with the stuttering and the no no you know and 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 just. Not, <laughs> the, the, uh, it, it, we've been so tired from the working. I, not that we didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole thing it would just turned it on its ear, and that's when we realized we have to really go with what their instincts are to 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 give this something different than the other animated films. Here's looking, uh, again for all of you, looking back after 20 years, do you see um, Prince of Egypt's influence on films, particularly animated films, that have come after? That this, you know, it was the first DreamWorks film and, and helped to establish the studio, but do you, see, do you look at other films and say, yeah, they're building on what we did? Yeah, yeah they stopped it. trying to draw them. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us still believe in drawing. Well, I'll say one influence about the movie. <laughs> Every year at the high holidays, I get to hear when you believe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the everlasting influence, I think. You know, there's a lot of pieces. One of the things that really stood out today and made me think of one of our uh, amazing artists that we had. We had only one Egyptian artist on the film, who did all the hieroglyphs. And I looked at that hieroglyph sequence today and thought how amazing it is because you've seen it in Ice Age. And you've seen it in a million other movies afterwards, but they took that idea of drawing us on the wall and bringing him to life. And I still love, I mean, looking at it 20 years later, I think what we did was pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I think the legacy is? The legacy is the seeds of the talent that that movie made in the industry. The ripples of that are all over Hollywood and the world now. That's the greatest thing to me, the, the number of talented people up there who have moved on. Well, no, I mean, the, your producers were saying earlier that they are now major figures in the directing industry. I'm sorry, Brenda. Go ahead. No, Richie's saying Hani. Um, yeah. Hani yes. definitely deserves credit for that. Although, although I think there's one thing that he always regretted, which was... SETI pointing, because hieroglyphs don't point, according to him. But so every time I see SETI pointing, <laughs> I think Hani. Yeah, I didn't, I, he didn't never told me that, actually. I did that scene. I didn't know about it, you know. But Hani, and he, he, you know, he was one of my best friends, and he passed away a couple of years ago in St. Joseph Hospital. But he was great. I mean, this guy was, you know, full of life. You know, he was a incredibly talented artist. Um, for, what, for what it's worth, Sandy, I still have to show that sequence in class when I teach the history of animation as something, one, that we hadn't seen before, and two, the graphic imagination in it, the way you use the curves of the pillars and the corners and the walls and the ceiling, all as part of a structure of the storytelling and the animation. It's not just architecture, it's the environment of the characters. I have to uh, say something here about that, and for the entire film, I feel like Simon really did give us an amazing looking film, because he was the head of layout, he was basically our cinematographer for the film, he did an amazing job, and I learned a lot from the institution. <laughs> you know, one thing that I, I, I almost called and said, let me bring this and play it, we have when you believe in what, 32 different languages, and we have it choreographed so that one goes into the other, 
because it was very important to us that this be relevant to everyone around the world, and we really had everyone singing that song, and it's an extraordinary uh, performance by all the people around the world who can identify with that song and its message. Um, you also mentioned, uh, Christoph, that doing some of the scenes of SETI, and I remember at the time, and, and still struck with, we don't often see genuinely old animated characters. They may have white hair, but they don't move like an old man or an old woman. And I think SETI was one of the first where you felt the stiffness in the spine and in the muscles. And Thank you. I'm just <laughs> I'm trying to study and to look at old men. That's, that's funny because I was thinking of said he, he dies throughout the movie, and this is uh, this, uh, the second time because the, in uh, Dragon I did a character who dies halfway through the, the movie, but and is also an um, uh, old character. Uh, I, I don't know. I remember looking at old people and just trying to see, and also uh, some. Um, uh, with uh, you know people with uh, like a royal attitude obviously uh, but it's hard for me to answer I don't know I just kind of studied hard to make it and I remember at the time you, you said that you talked to uh, Patrick Stewart and he, he said to you that he remembered one of his teacher remember that? <laughs> yes and that was kind of a compliment yeah, we now know, all know what it feels like to be old. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe no, you I, I was lucky that uh, because Sally was there at the beginning of the movie, I got to animate him all. You know, and that was a big difference on my work because I remember uh, working on Prince of Egypt doing Sally for the first couple of months, and I, I had a team of one animator, and it was really enjoying doing everything myself. And then I switched from Seti to Old Moses, which all of a sudden I had a team of 35 animators and <laughs> couldn't animate as much. And it was great, it was a great challenge, but it, you know, so I got to, uh, to do the Seti character on my own and then supervise a team and cray we tantrum of artists for the rest of the movie. Great. Um, we, uh, we have to sort of wrap up, but one thing I'd like to uh, bring up is that 20 years later, this film seems almost prescient that its moment uh, its message of the struggle for freedom seems, if anything, more relevant today, I think, than it was when you made it. Is that, <laughs> <laughs> Is that old people? <laughs> okay, we would like to thank our guests uh, for their insights into an extraordinary film, and we thank you for attending Animation is Film.